Morning, good evening, and good afternoon. And wherever you are in this wide, wonderful, beautiful world that we live in, you are very welcome to another exciting episode of the Global Sales Leader Podcast. I am your host, Jason Cooper. We embark on a journey into the dynamic world of sales, guided by the expert insights of our incredible host, that's myself. So prepare to be captivated and as we delve into the diverse range of subjects from sales leadership, psychology to behavior, economics, body language, linguistic technology, and beyond that. And in this episode, we have episode two with my good friend Bodhi. So Bodhi, um, after 20 years as a lawyer, he sold his legal practice in around about 2000 or so and studied with renowned leaders in leadership development, Global Leadership Association, Boston, UK, systemic constellation work from London, UK, psychotherapy, coaching certifications, open up communication, and the art of presence. So uh, you worked over 20 countries and empowering teams to develop leaders and leadership and also so much more that delves into ourselves and understanding ourselves a little bit more. So Bodhi, uh, episode two, I'm so looking forward to this. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, great to be back and yeah, such juicy topics. Absolutely. So today we're actually delving into different personality types of uh, salespeople, clients, but also the team leaders to actually manage this and how are we going to do this? So I'm uh, I'm always intrigued by this because as a sales leader, you always have different personality types, but that also enhances the team because you can't have the same type of person because you need different personality types to help engage with collaboration, performance, and so on and so forth, but also on the client side is to understand their personality type. So the question I'm going to ask is how does understanding personality types help sales professionals build stronger client relationships? Yeah, it's something that, you know, obviously lots and lots of books on this, lots of studies on this, behavioral science, behavioral studies. What we know is that underpinning personality types you know, there are some other drivers which affect team which affect performance and whilst personality types can give you an insight into the introverts the extroverts the the thinkers the feelers the intuits which is all valuable mm. uh, what i thought might be useful for you and your listeners particularly given um, yours is about being the relationship coach is maybe just explore some of those deeper drivers which having coached many many organizations globally really accelerate yep the group the team yep whether it's sales or anything else that you're looking to experience mm, yeah i'm fascinated by that because i think uh, relationships is core at what we do as uh, coaches and as trainers because we've got to delve into each and every person to build that relationship up because I think sales is all about relationships for the longevity because you want to help people to get what they want but you also want to be that trusted advisor so they can call you but it has to be under the area of trust which is the core of what we do yeah yeah again the trust word is a, is a big word and just a couple of distinctions so you know we often talk about relationships and certainly most people would say that what creates a successful relationship is communication effective mm. communication yet again when i work with organizations and leaders it starts with the relationship and communication you have with yourself that's the key Mm. When we start looking at the different types of leadership, the way you communicate with yourself, remember we have 80,000 thoughts a day, most of them are negative. Yeah. The ability to get presence, as you know, a lot of my work working with male leaders is the journey from distraction to presence. Because if you're not present, you're not going to be effective as a communicator yeah, and as a leader. 
yeah and the relationship with self which is driven often by our inability to really be present with our emotions which are giving us information all the time yeah we're so overwhelmed with information and data especially nowadays this ridiculous amount being thrown at us from technology to people to the surroundings buildings and so on and so forth and it distracts our thoughts and then we've got that pressure of hitting the kpis doing this making sure that our team is working mm. pro proactively and they're hitting their kpis making sure that they're okay and in this world now of wellness are they supported are they making sure that they're not under duress and stress but they still need to be hitting their numbers and so it's a it's a damned if i do and damned if i don't sort of situation but how can we make sure that they control that i think it's controlling their own environment and controlling their own emotions but it's it is a i think it's a skill that you need to develop over time yeah what we're looking for is you know self-regulation yeah which as you say you could call control it's how do i regulate myself how do i regulate my system my mental system emotional system energetic system nervous system yeah and what we're where we're, where we're aiming yeah remember each day jason there's two trains that leave your house yeah the flow train or the resistance train and so if we can get leaders and groups into flow yeah by the ability to start to regulate their system Mm. Yeah, then then the personality types can express themselves. Yeah, we all have different superpowers that we bring to a team. Yeah, what I know is if we can do it from the deeper inside out, you'll really harness the potential of your team, yeah, and the potential of really serving your customers. So when you speak about flow, like I understand what flow means, but uh for yeah. the audience, how can you we get people into more of a state of flow because it's hard to get yourself into it. But once you're into it, it's great, but it's getting flow in the first place. Yeah. Uh, give them some really good insights to how we can actually get into that place of flow. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally um, when I, when I work with leaders, the key is the ability to get present. Yeah, and we know that when you get present, you get connected with a deeper part of yourself. Yeah, and if you like, flow is the opposite to resistance. So through the practices I teach, which are simple practices, working with elite sports people, working with leaders, teaching them to get into the place of flow. Yeah, and notice what takes you out. Our natural state is flow. Mm. You go, I know you like your outdoor exercise, you know, when yeah. you go for a bike ride or a run, connect with nature, we get into that place of flow. Yeah. The mastery is what takes me out. What is it that disturbs me? Where is the resistance emotionally, our thinking mind? And so teaching people, yeah, that getting into flow actually is our natural state. Staying in flow is where the practice is. Mm. And when this comes to teams, yeah, what we know is underpinning any successful organization, any successful team, yeah, there is connection and direction. And the studies now on the brain are really clear. There's a part of our brain that is constantly seeking connection and belonging. It's an innate desire. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, you can cultivate this. You can cultivate this in yourself you can cultivate this in your team by being connected with yourself first through the practices of presence. Yeah. Noticing any resistance when you create this place of connection and belonging. Yeah. And belonging is really, are they connected with the DNA of the business? Mm. Are they connected with the heart and soul of this organization? You know, there's been a lot of conversations about the why the purpose yet connection yeah is is broader than that that's part of it but it's broader than that because we know if people belong then what you mentioned about trust and safety follow yeah i completely yeah. agree exactly yeah. i think connection is absolutely core of working with a, an organization also connection with yourself but you really need to have that good feeling about the organization that it's a it's a trusted uh, environment 
but you also feel like you're belonging there. You're you're within and part of the team and the organization itself. And they, that word empathy, they understand and they're doing everything to support you in the best way that they can to make sure that you're adding value to the organization, but you're also adding value to the bottom line. But you wanting to do that, not being told to do that. I think that's a two different distinctions between that because so many organizations get it wrong and you're there for a job as opposed to being part of it. And I think yes. that's always the challenge with a lot of organizations. But it, I suppose it does start with the top down. So leaders have to get that right. And then it should trickle it down because you're at the helm of the ship, I suppose. Yeah, the three keys, the three aspects of leadership, there's self-leadership, there's relational leadership, mm -hmm. and there's systemic leadership. And depending where you sit in an organisation, remembering that everyone effectively is a leader, every, you know, if we define leadership as influence. And a lot of the organisations I work with, the influence is from the informal leaders. Yeah, there's informal leadership and formal leadership. Yet mm -hmm. if you really want to drive vision, if you really want to drive purpose, if you really want to drive culture, then you do need buy-in at the top. Yeah. And so connection at the top, self-leadership, as we've discussed. Yep. Then what happens is the other side, there's connection and direction. So we know through the neuroscience, there's a part of our brain that's looking for agency and autonomy. Yep. And this applies to your team as well. We have a desire for connection and we have a desire for agency. And because these can be seen as pol polarizing and polarities, it takes a lot of awareness in a leader to firstly integrate that in themselves. Mm. And then also, how do I do this? How do I create a team where they feel safe and belong? And they also have a level of agency, autonomy and accountability. And that's when we start to get into a bit more of the personality types. And uh, the point I was thinking of while you were speaking is also inclusion. You know, they've got diversity, equity and inclusion, but it's also inclusion to really understand your people properly and understanding their backgrounds and where they're from to make sure that you understand how they can operate and I think we're just going to trickle into their personality types because everyone is different. you got the introverts, you've got the extroverts, but you've also got different types around that as well because the introvert is happy to work at home on their own. They're happy with their own environment, but the extrovert might not be um, yeah. happy to work at home on their own so they need that social influence around them to strive them forward whereas the introvert might not necessarily need that within your team and this is the point you know uh, the point of inclusion is what does true connection mean yeah because if you're truly connected with somebody then they're included it doesn't matter yeah about the diversity mm-hmm yeah, and this is the deeper places of being present, fully connected. And then when it comes to things like the introvert, extrovert, as you say. So one of the beautiful pieces of work is a work is a piece of work called the four tendencies. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's um, interested in looking at some simple tools yeah, from this place of connection and direction. So what we know is that direction in any relationship is simply communicating your expectations and having them met. And as we touched on last time, I think, so Jason, you're uh, you're married? Yes. Yep. And how long have you been married now? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Since, uh, <laughs> I, I can I never get it correct. It's over 10 years anyway. Uh, we've been together 20 years. I never yeah. get it right. I, I've got a rough idea. Yeah, probably about 14, 15 years, I think. Great, great. So if you think about expectations, successful relationships are really, really simple. Communicate your expectations and have them met. Mm. So on the wedding day, did you talk to your partner and say, here are my expectations for the next 40 years, please meet them? Yep. 
You did? Because <laughs> most yes, people... Yes, 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 you did, yes. Yeah, I, I seem to if remember... I this, it. you probably didn't. Because <laughs> expectations change all the time. Yeah. And so when we come to expectations, the four tendencies, yep, there are four types, if you want to lean a bit into personality types. So one tendency type is what's called the upholder. Mm. Now, the upholder... Yeah, can hold themselves accountable. Yeah, we talk about agency, we talk about autonomy, and we talk about accountability. They intrinsically can set a task, yeah, and internally they have the personality type, they have the drivers where they'll hold themselves accountable. It's part mm. of their DNA. Another type is the questioner. Now, the questioner will never accept direction until they have all their questions answered. So if you've got a question in your team, they have to get to the bottom yet yeah, of the why. Mm -hmm. And you've got to take time to get clear with them. Yeah, what is the purpose of this task? The beauty with the questioner is, and they may seek external help. This applies in your personal life. It applies in your business life. The beauty with the questioner is once you get buy-in, they'll absolutely do it they hold themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. Another type is the rebel. So we've got the upholder, we've got the questioner, we've got the rebel. Now the challenge with the rebel, and again, anyone out there who is a rebel or has a rebel or has children who are rebels, yeah, you say A, yeah, they'll do B. The key with the rebel, and this isn't just based on gender, is it has to be their idea. Mm. Yeah, they've got to come to it as if it's their idea because they want to rebel against something. And it's it's quite easy working with rebels when you understand that they want to rebel. Mm. The fourth type is what's called the obliger. Now, the obliger is fascinating because the obliger inherently, yeah, and I can see you're smiling as an obliger, the obliger finds it really difficult to hold themselves accountable, but will be accountable to something outside of them. Is that the more obliger. of a, a yes person as opposed yep. to they say yes to everything, even though yep. when they know it's wrong, I, I know a few people like that. They just yep. say yes to things, but all they're doing is they're pushing back. But it's also annoyance as well because they don't believe what they're saying is true. They're just doing it to just hold off push back and go, I, I don't want to, I don't want this stress. I don't want this, that, and the other. So they just are not being accountable for their own actions, but they're just pushing back. Yep. 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 They're, blind. they're people pleasers. They're the yep. rescuers. They yep. take on everything. And there is the passive aggressive resentment that builds up. Mm. Yep. Now the key working with obligers is um, teaching them to set boundaries, teaching them to value themselves from the inside out and teaching them how to keep themselves accountable, self-accountable as well as, as well as relational accountable. So yeah. the obliger classically will be, if the obliger wants to start running to get fit, you know, if the obliger agrees to meet you at six o'clock in the morning to go for a run, they will always be there. Yep. But if the obliger goes, I'm gonna get up at six o'clock in the morning to go for a run, they don't have that intrinsic ability. It, they're too busy obliging everybody else instead of obliging themselves yeah i actually worked with a, a manager on that and it was fascinating to see because she couldn't stop being interrupted by all of her teammates all of the time which stopped her from actually doing her own work and the problem was she was saying yes too much but it, it was distracting for her because she couldn't get the stuff that was most promising for her own work. So she was a new manager in that area. So you had to set boundaries around that and probably a little bit of time management just to push back a little bit when she's actually ready to help as opposed to going, yes, all the time, I'll help you now, I'll help you now. When you're in a bit of a, a doing a deck or presentation yourself or whatever you're doing, and it is, it's, I think I find that quite fascinating, the obliger and the people pleasers, because 
the others I can probably deal with, but the obliges is just almost a frustration as well. Yeah. Yeah, the body of work was done by a lady called Gretchen Rubin, R-U-B-I-N, and uh, you can put her link in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, she came up with this after studying, you know, thousands and thousands of individuals. And the obliger is a tricky one, particularly in organisations. And as I say, one of the keys working with obligers is, see, people don't really understand what boundaries are. Mm. Yeah. And we've got, you know, there's there's a conversation there. And as we know, uh, with the masculine and feminine energy, which we've spoken about several times, you know, which isn't necessarily gender based. But what we know is that the and the studies around our brain in neuroscience is quite clear that there's a part of our brain that is seeking seeking connection that can deal with complexity. Yeah. And what happens is that part of our brain is connecting with everything in an organization. So as a generalization, a lot of the feminine energy, which may be for females, yeah, when they walk into a team meeting, yeah, they're connecting with everything that's going on. Mm. Now, as an obliger, that's really tricky because it's they're not necessarily aware of how to set boundaries. You know, often working with obligers, we say, you know, you have your to-do list and also your to-don't list. Yeah. Because there are some things not to do. You don't have to pick them up. Even though you're aware of them, you're connected to what needs to happen in the team. Yeah, you don't have to do that. Now, that's tricky and takes some rewiring because the others in the team, consciously or unconsciously, will go, oh, I'll just give this to Jason. He'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he'll get it done. He'll get it. And Jason will take it on and take it on. And then there'll be that, hang on a tick. I have no time for what I'm supposed to do. Yep, yeah, all of that behaviour. Yeah. Um, and so, again, the neuroscience is clear and the, and the, the shift can happen. Yeah. And this is, again, this is that part of connection and then and expectations mm. yeah, because the obligers, the obligers just take everything on. Yeah, I worked with someone recently and uh, almost had to put them into that Stephen Covey matrix urgent, important, urgent, not important, and so on and so forth, just to make them realize where they should be prioritizing their time as opposed yeah. to sometimes, uh, depending on whether they're visually orientated or they're kinesthetic orientated or they're auditory or whatever, because that plays a part in it as well. Because myself, I'm, I'm quite a visually orientated person. So if I need to change, that's what I need to see. I need to be shown and do it but the the kinesthetic person is slightly different so there's other yeah. different things going on internally that we have to try and recognize as well yeah one of the best tips for the obligers if if you if you find yourself being an obliger jason and you know obligers is the and again if we link it back to accountability if we link it back to expectations so obligers if they have a version of themselves, yeah, who they really want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Because often there's tension for them, resistance, you know, I'm that passive aggressive, I'm picking everything up, you know, just out of their old patterns. If they can, as you say, as a visual or a kinesthetic, if they can feel and visualize and connect with the version of themselves they want to be, then each day they can hold themselves accountable to that person. Mm. So the accountability is still external, a vision of themselves. But every decision you make or they make is, is this aligned with that version of me or not? Mm. And quickly they can start to change any limiting beliefs, any limiting behaviour and start to align with that and hold themselves accountable to that version of themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. And a complete continuity within themselves. Congruence yeah. is the word I was looking for. Yeah, oh, maybe yeah, it works. Absolutely. Everything has to be yeah. in line. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, what I was thinking of, uh, I think once you understand your teams in that area and they understand where they're at, there's also recognition to understand their clients and their customers as well as because, again, well, everyone's human and we're going back to those four different personality types as well because your clients and customers are exactly the same. But then it's how do we recognize that in others is the core skill to have. Appreciating yourself, but 
understanding other people as well where they actually are yeah well the beauty with customers and sales again if we go a little bit deeper into connection and direction so again if you think about sales which i think is one of the most noblest things on the planet mm. yeah and i think we're doing it all the time even though it can have different connotations yeah absolutely fundamentally if you can connect with your customer the first thing in sales is identifying a need. Yeah. So through connection, you're identifying what is the need, mm. whether you're selling widgets, whether you're selling professional services, whatever it is you're selling. And so underpinning it is if, how do I connect with this person? And what I know the fundamental, again, repeating for connection is presence. I know that every leader I work with, Yep, is spending more time in distraction and stress than presence. Yep. And it's the first thing I teach them how to get present, simple practices, and then with their teams, how to get present, how to cultivate presence, how to support each other from presence. Because if you're present, you're connected. If you're connected, you'll identify your customer's need. Yeah. The second part is whatever that need is, a big part of sales is to support the person to take action. Yep. Yeah. And that's the direction. And so connection and direction. If I'm connected and identify what your need is, how can I support you to take action? Mm. Whether it's buying me, my my product, my commodity, or somehow other other way of meeting that need. Yeah. And action comes from a level of tension. See, tension always wants to release itself. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge for a lot of people, particularly in sales, is that if you create some tension, you're going to support the other person to take action. Mm -hmm. And if you're truly there to be of service, yeah, then it's not necessarily about taking action with me. It's like, taking action to resolve this need. Yep. And the way we create tension yep, is not about being liked, which a lot of salespeople think it is. It's about really leaning in and supporting the person to notice what's their resistance to taking action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And often that is by asking some of the emotional questions because it, it'll always come back to an emotion. Yeah. And everyone thinks and feels in emotions and the, the uh, limbic system in our brain is the emotion. Uh, all of our uh, emotional pushes, our beliefs, our values and everything else. I think a good bit cortisol is actually quite good as a bit of stress because that does take action. Obviously, too much stress actually will do the reverse thing and you start to feel it. You go, hang on a minute, there's something you're pushing me too much here. But I think a good bit of questioning to make people think, I think it's good. And it goes into the rational part of our brains eventually. So we can actually get onto the neocortex, the, the thinking part of our brain. So we can actually sort of crunch the information, but not too much because we are all emotional people. And we do need that to strive us and push us forward as well. Yeah. And again, if you come back to your purpose with sales, and come back to your original um, comments about high stress teams, uh, lots of information, lots yep. of KPIs, lots of pressure. Again, you know, the leaders listening, uh, the owners of the businesses listening, what we know is you've got to create an environment, you've got to cultivate an environment mm. you know, where this sense of connection and belonging is there. And now it's actually easier than you think. Some of the listeners might be going, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy trying to <laughs> meet my KPIs. Um, it's actually easier than you think. And it doesn't take as much work as people think. Yet it just means that the leader, the owner of the business or the leader of the team have to be willing to lean into something very different. Because the old KPI, um, motivation, all of that, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yet what we know is that the high stress levels now. So when you were talking about the, the brain, yeah, so when the stress exceeds optimal states, yeah, what happens is parts of our frontal cortex is shutting down. Our decision making mm -hmm. is not functioning at all. Yep. 
Yeah. And again, so if you've got that as a leader and if you've got that in your team, then again, you know, we can talk about KPIs and motivation, but it's such a fundamental piece. It's like, it's literally like operating with 60 or 70% of your operating system. Yeah. Yeah. Because everything else shuts down and different yeah. people see it from different ways. Because I, I, I've seen it myself uh, when I've been in a high stress situation, but I've also seen it to other people as well. Um, pe it's something doesn't seem to be as present as it should be. Yep. Yeah. The three responses are expression, suppression, or distraction. Yep. Yeah, that's what. So the expression can be the aggressive person, the big loud person. The suppression is when we suppress the emotions. Yep, repress ourselves. Again, which we all know. Yep, deal to lead to stress, and then the distraction, which is the other big one. We just distract ourselves. Yeah, and that is easily done. And I've seen it in organisations where uh, the leader is so busy they have back to back to back to back to back meetings every 30 minutes but they don't allow a break in between and we know from the, the studies of the brain and neuroscience that different parts of the brain light up they don't have time to think which is reflection and self-reflection of how do i deal with the last thing and when you're going into the next meeting you're thinking about the last meeting as opposed to being in that space and especially when you're dealing with customers, you need to be thoughtful in that space of how I'm going to solve that challenge, whatever it might be that's presenting in front of you, as opposed to relying on, I still haven't sorted that or solved the previous thing that I was doing. And it just, it's a spiraled effect. And that's probably what you were speaking about is parts of the brain can shut off. Yeah, the analogy, which I, I may have mentioned last time is, if you think of the two woodchoppers who, you know, are moving into the into the forest, the, the replant the plantation forest to chop down the trees, mm. and they both start the day with a very sharp axe, and one woodchopper decides to just go as hard and as fast as he can, chop 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 chop, and the other one, every hour he stops, takes a rest, has a drink of water, does some stretches, sharpens his axe, yeah. Who's going to chop down more trees, Jason? Mm. Yeah, we don't take time to sharpen our racks. And the biggest thing with sharpening your racks is to slow the mind. Yeah, and this is where presence is. The first part of getting present is we've got to unwind the mind. Yeah, embodied presence is how do I unwind the mind and get more present and connected with myself. And the traditional teachings that I've studied it can be quite quick and simple to get embodied and to stay embodied during your day. Simple techniques, simple practices. Again, where you come from that place of presence, you come from that place of flow, you notice the disturbance and resistance and you're much more effective. And it's not about going harder, it's about going in flow. When we go harder, we go into resistance. It's like the hose pipe has a kink in it. And we're mm -hmm. pushing all this energy into it, but it's not flowing. Yeah, when we get present and in the flow, our energy's in the flow, we become much more effective. Yeah. Communication's more effective, connection's more, more effective, all of those things that we're talking about. Which leads us to that conclusion, because I love that point there from where we started when we discussed a lot of different areas about the four personality types, uh, understanding yourself as a leader, but also understanding others within that and the stress reflexes and be congruent with ourselves and also to it's about the customers about the teams about the team leaders but everything has to come from the top downwards to get that right environment where there's connection and inclusion and the the right way of belonging within the organization. So Bodhi, you've been incredible today. I, I love this part two, it's been really good. I'm sure we could have a series about this and then write a book <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> well, the good news for the listeners is I've just launched a podcast um, called True Freedom. And so it'll be in the show notes. And if you wanna find out more, um, it'll be there. I'm sure you and I, Jason, will definitely come back together and you know discuss this. And for any of your listeners, it really encourage you to take action. 
Yeah, often we listen to these things and they're great, yet what action can I take? Yeah, and my support for you is find a way to start unwinding that mind. Yeah, and reflection, meditation, all of those things. And on my website, there's, uh, there's some meditations there. There's the five steps to freedom and flow. So there's plenty of stuff for our listeners. Awesome stuff. Thank you once again. Uh, you've listened to the Global Sales Leader podcast. My name's Jason Cooper, and I must appreciate uh, Bodie Audrid for this another incredible, and I, I'd like to say different from um, other podcasts because we like to look at different areas because it's all about growth. It's all about you growing. And I always like to suggest if you can take one thing out of every podcast to enable it to build in your own learnings to help you excel in whatever you do. So again, appreciate that. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Jason.